Let's go ahead and take out our Bibles, and we're going to turn to John chapter 12, John tap, chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. This is going to form the foundation for our, our time in God's Word this morning. And of course, what else would it be but, you know, the Palm Sunday event. Here's what it says. The next day, the news that Jesus on his way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. They shouted, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it, fulfilling the prophecy that said, do not be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming, riding on a donkey's colt. His disciples didn't understand at that time that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. But after Jesus entered his glory, they remembered that what he had said and what had happened and realized that these things had been written about him. Many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and they were telling others about it. That was the reason so many went out to meet him, because they had heard about this miraculous sign. Then the Pharisees said to each other, there's nothing we can do. Look, everyone has gone after him. If we take a look at our first place that we're going to be landing in God's word this morning, it's Matthew 18, 1, uh, and we'll give you some time to turn to that. Uh, we have Bibles in the seats with you, or if you have a... Uh, smartphone or some other type of electronic device that has a Bible app on it, please feel free to uh, follow along. Our sermon notes are printed out in the uh, sermon, uh, in the, in the uh, bulletin this morning. And this is our roadmap through God's Word. And you'll notice that there are some blanks here that we're going to be filling in together. But there's also space here for you to be able to write down some of the things that, that God will speak, be speaking into your heart and your life today. And, and, Believe that he is, that he is going to, to speak into your heart and your life this morning. As we read this passage, it's, it's probably very, very familiar to a lot of us. And yet there's a lot that's going on that perhaps we don't often see because we're so busy celebrating. We're celebrating Jesus entering Jerusalem triumphantly. We're celebrating all that's about to happen. But one of the things that we're not really realizing, what we're not recognizing, is that there's a lot more going on here than meets the eye. It's not just a Jesus taking a victory lap because the real, the real trial was now ahead of him. And as we get to the end of the week, we'll be seeing what that meant, what it cost the Lord to bring us back together with him. And our first point on the outline says this, the crowds shouted Hosanna, which kind of roughly translated means save us or God save us. That's what Hosanna means. And as you listen to their words and as you hear their shouts, they're saying all the right words. They're, they're, they're doing all the right things, but they're doing it for all the wrong reasons. They're looking to Jesus to be their deliverer. I would say they're even looking for him to be their savior, but they're not looking to him to be their savior from their sins. They're not looking for Jesus to be their savior from the spiritual mess that humanity has got itself into. They were looking for Jesus to be a warrior king. And when you think about this, the people who were in the crowd, many of them had heard about Lazarus' resurrection. A number of them had actually seen it, had actually been there. And if you remember, Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. And as they rolled back that stone, as Jesus commanded the sisters, the stench of death was overwhelming. Lazarus was dead and his his decomposing body was bearing witness to it. And it's at this moment where it seems that Jesus is incredibly insensitive to the grieving family that why would anybody, why would anybody 
exhume the body four days later? Why would, why would Jesus reopen that ugly wound? And yet Jesus encourages them to believe. If you'll just believe, you'll see God do incredible things. And Jesus stands outside that, that, that dark and noisome tomb, that stench flowing over him. And he calls out in a loud and commanding voice, Lazarus, come forth. And the dead man came back to life. And this wasn't some sort of zombie apocalyptic life. The stench is immediately gone. The body that was corrupted is now made whole again. And the dead man comes walking out of the tomb. No one has ever seen anything like this before. And the crowds are in awe of what Jesus can do. And you can imagine that the religious leaders were scared because soon after this meet, after this happened, there was a meeting because the, these religious leaders always had their spies everywhere watching Jesus. Isn't that amazing how so-called spiritual people like to spy on others? And they bring back their report to the Sanhedrin and especially to the high priest. And we saw one of the observations from the Pharisees. Look, the whole world is going after him on Palm Sunday. But before that happens, they meet to discuss this, this miracle of Jesus. They couldn't deny it. They couldn't cover it up. They couldn't say it didn't happen. They couldn't, have said, they couldn't say it was AI generated. And so hard was their heart and so wicked and dark inside there that though they saw the signs, a dead man, four days, rotting, stinking, dead, raised again to life, instead of falling on their knees with God is among us, all they could think of was how Jesus was posing a threat to their structure, to their power to their authority, never understanding that Jesus didn't want to have anything to do with their structure, their power, and their authority. He wasn't there to disrupt them. He was there to bring the kingdom of God. And if that disrupted them, then that's the way it is. And so in that moment, they decide what they're going to do with Jesus. Jesus is a dead man walking. This is the backdrop of, of what's going on. And the religious leaders are frightened of losing their position. They're frightened of Jesus raising a rebellion, or even if Jesus doesn't, then his disciples and followers, because there have been people who tried to force Jesus to be their king. Remember that? You read it earlier in Jesus' ministry, how they came by force to make Jesus king, and Jesus suddenly disappeared from among them. It wasn't his time, and this wasn't the kingship he's looking for. Indeed, this wasn't the kingship he was brought into this world to establish. He came to establish the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of men on earth, another political system that, oh, maybe for a while it would be great and wonderful. But the religious leaders were worried about what Rome would do. Yeah. Jerusalem, Israel had always been a hotbed of rebellion. And the Romans knew this. And so every Passover, Jerusalem would be reinforced with extra soldiers in case false messiahs arose and rebellion broke out. And this is one of the things that the religious leaders were afraid of. They, they remember from their history how the Babylonians came in and destroyed their temple and wiped, nearly wiped all of God's people out. And they're so afraid of their precious positions that they're willing to kill a man because they think it's better, and this is what the high priest prophesied that year, it is better for one man, Jesus, to die than for the whole nation to die. And he thinks, and it was something that God prophetically gave to him, the problem is that the high priest didn't understand what God was saying to him. He thought it was God giving him permission, let's take this guy out. But what God was saying, no, it's, it's better for one man because only one man can die, not just for the sins of a nation but for the sins of the whole world. The vision here is so myopic. And so the high priest is so worried that Rome will come in and, and wipe them out again. 
And they're worried and they're thinking about what the people are thinking. Because if there's a man who can raise the dead from the dead, the Romans can throw legions after legions after legions against the people of God. But if Jesus wants to raise them to life, there's no way the Romans would win. You see what a distorted picture people were getting. But it's what happens when we get into those desperate places in our lives where we're so, we're so wanting something to change that we're not really looking at the thing that God wants to do in our life, the, the, the spiritual changes, the, the transformation that God wants to take place in our life. Because kingdoms come and kingdoms go, beloved. History, human history, it teaches us at least this. Kingdoms come, kingdoms go. And we touched on this last week, you know, about the, the political environment that we live in. It's one of the reasons why I won't get into discussing politics in church. And it's not because it's just in poor taste, but it's, it, it's, it's more this to me. It's that there's a greater message, and I don't want to distill it down and pollute it with things about pol politics and telling people how you must vote. I leave it to God and to work in your life and, and your conscience to hear the things of God that are preached here and the things that, that you take in through your own time and God's word and then to look at the issues that are before you and then make the right God-driven, God-revealed decisions in your life. Not the things that necessarily might just benefit you because some of the things that, that you may need to vote on will not benefit you, but they will benefit more people than just one person. And I want the church, and that to me has always been the thing about not dragging the politics into it. Because the message of Jesus Christ is so much more important than who wins the election this year. I know it's intense, and I know it's important. I'm not dismissing that. But it is minimal compared to the kingship of Jesus in your life, in your heart, and your ability to bring that life-giving, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Political parties come and go, and they will bring this kind of change and that kind of change, but it always evaporates. But the things of God never dis disappear. The things that God is doing in your heart and your life do not evaporate. They're all building to something better and stronger and greater. The people surrounding Jesus, Jesus coming into Jerusalem, they were looking for another King David. They wanted a warrior king. And that wasn't the kingship that Jesus came to bring. Not because it wasn't important, but because it wasn't as important as what the world needed. And that God would, in the midst of all the kingdoms of this world, in the very heart of Satan's power and death grip on this planet, God is going to build his own kingdom. And beloved, you're sitting in it right now. You're part of it right now. And it's not just you. It's everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. Everyone who believes in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We're part of the kingdom of God. We often look around and we look at the church and we think, we're divided, we're divided. And, and there are divisions in our church. It must break God's heart. But the church in this sense is not divided. And that is that core belief that Jesus Christ is the living Son of God. That Jesus went to the cross, as we're going to see on Good Friday, went to the cross, died for my sins and for the sins of the whole world. That means your sins too. Did it all for you. And nothing can take that away. That's the greater kingdom that Jesus establishes here on earth. And our kingdom is meant to impact the world around us. Not so that we establish a theocracy or that we impose our beliefs on everybody, politically and every, in every way, but instead through those gentle ways like Jesus did. Jesus let the kingdom of God speak through him, through his actions, to choose a kingdom that really lasts, a kingdom you can always get behind, a leader it doesn't matter what the polls say about, and you don't have to worry whether you'll have the electoral votes or not, for he is already our savior. He's already won that place in our hearts. 
And we live to serve him. The people in the crowd didn't get that yet, nor really could they. But they were so blinded by this, this oppression and the onerous taxes that the things of this world were totally pushing out the things that God wanted to reveal to them, the things they really needed, the salvation that they desperately needed, the freedom that mankind really, truly was looking for, that only Jesus could give, and only in this way. And even the disciples were swept up in this belief that, that Jesus would somehow be this, this political powerhouse leader. And because they put in the hard work, they'd been with him since the beginning of the ministry, they were always jockeying for position of who's going to be at Jesus' right hand. Who's going to be closest to the seat of power? Who's going to be able to, in a sense, manip manipulate Jesus in the way that, that they want and that we have this special relationship, we have this special connection. And the beauty of it is, beloved, we all have this special relationship. We all have this special connection to Jesus. No one is better or stronger. We are all sons and daughters of God. And we all have that special, unique connection. God doesn't love others more than you. He doesn't love you more than others. He loves each and every one of us. And those of us who are parents, we understand how it's not about whether someone loves somebody more or less. It's that we love each other and we love our children uniquely for who they are. And God loves us uniquely for who we are because he created us to be who we are. The disciples didn't get it. They were constantly arguing among themselves. And look what the outcome of it was. They were constantly angry at each other, constantly getting indignant because somebody thought up sooner a way of getting at Jesus that they hadn't thought of. They're not so mad that, they, that that person went to Jesus and said, let me be second in, in control, but were angry that they didn't think of it first. And then Jesus is constantly having to tell them, would you guys knock this off? Don't you get it yet? It's not made up of who's got the power. It's built on service and who's willing to serve and willing to serve for the right reasons. Not serve to be served, but serve because you genuinely want to be a part of what God is doing in this world. And maybe you'll never get recognized and maybe you'll never get honored in this world by others. But God honors you. And when we come to that place of understanding that we are valued, not by what others think, we're not defined by what others think, but by what Jesus has done and what the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives and what he wants to do going forward. Then, beloved, we're operating more and more in the kingdom of God. And that's a good place to be. As we take a look at Matthew 18, 1, we, we take a look at how even the disciples didn't get it. About that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They were obsessed with this thing. And every one of them was hoping that Jesus would say their name. I often think of Jesus as they're doing this going, oy vey. What are you not getting, guys? So much so that he said this, that it shamed them. They still didn't have the right picture. They still couldn't put their pride and their arrogance and their ego aside. They just learned not to bring it up to Jesus anymore. But they were still thinking about it. Oh, yeah, it was big in their hearts. And that leads us to our next point, and that is Jesus grieves over such spiritual blindness. You see, they're spiritually blind and Jesus grieves over that blindness. Not just the blindness of his people at times. Our failure to recognize is what, what we're talking about. They failed to recognize who Jesus is. They weren't letting Jesus be who he wants to be. Have you ever been in a relationship where somebody won't let you be who you are? It's always trying to reshape you into something else. And beloved, for those of us who, who are in that category of being reshapers, you need to take a step back and ask yourself, am I God? Am I here trying to recreate somebody in my image or what I think they ought to be? That's none of my business. That's not my place. That's not 
what God has called me to do. I'm like, I'm, for me, it's like, I got enough dealing with me. Could you imagine having to be me and deal with me? It's pretty rough. I figure I got my hands full because I am a handful. I don't need to be playing around in somebody else's life. And I think a lot of times when we feel the need to play around other people's lives, it's because we don't want to deal with our own life. We don't want to deal with our own stuff. It seems too, too big, too uh, out of reach, or, or we just feel, that's ah, not that big of a deal. I, I think I'm just going to shift my focus away from me onto somebody else. And Lord, help the person who is the object of your attention. We are not to make people in our own image. We're certainly to encourage people to, to find the fullness of the image of Christ in them, but we're not there to, to tell them what to do and what to be. It's a failure to recognize God at work in that individual believer's life. That God has an individual plan for each one of you in this room. Each one of you are unique. You are. And I'm not just saying that because it's cool and it's hip to say that now. And that studies show that people want to be told they're special. My mom used to tell me I was special all the time, but... Special back then was different than special now. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Charlie. Charlie says I'm special. And thank you, Charlie, because I know that's kindly meant. And yet, God loves us for the unique person that we are. Not what we're going to be. He loves you. He loves you and is in love with you. And I think it breaks his heart when his other sons and daughters start picking on each other. Because they fail to recognize that God has a work that he's going to do in your life. And he will bring people into your life that will help you on that journey. But not to condemn you and try to, to reshape you and make you the way they want you to be. But by that gentle encouragement and that living example. You'll know the difference when you run into it. Jesus grieves over such spiritual blindness as this because he knows the pain and the hurt that it causes we take a look at Luke 13, 34, that's the next place we're going to be going in, in God's Word. Some of the things that, that cause us to be blind, and we've already kind of touched on this in our reading uh, this morning, but some of those things, I think, if we take a look at our own selves, we see that a lot of it is driven by selfishness, self-centeredness, ego, pride, and especially today, shameful, self-indulgent pleasures. We want to live our life the way we want to live it. And if it's good with God, that's great. But if it isn't, we still want to live it the way we want it. And we don't want anybody, especially God, butting in and telling us, that's not good for you. So often we have this distorted view that God is against fun. That's just not true. But Satan has been masterful at getting people to think that it's fun to be edgy and, and out on the edge and, 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 to, and to tweak life and to tweak God and, and to live on those, those exciting, adrenaline-filled moments. And, and sometimes they are. They're very exciting. But the price we pay afterward and the prices that other people pay afterwards and the spiritual destruction it does to us, the self-inflicted wounds we do to ourselves because we're thinking we're having fun. And it turns out, that God was right all along. That that fun thing wasn't really fun, was it? You had a momentary burst of pleasure and joy and you may spend years and maybe the rest of your life dealing with the, the fallout from that moment of pleasure and fun. I often think of this especially in the relationship between husbands and wives who find themselves out and and they, I just, I had a fling as if that was, like, that's cool. I went out and flinged. I went and had a fling. Our marriage was in a rut, so I went and had a fling. I was flinging. Don't be mad at me. I was just going out flinging. Come on, man. Give me a break. Everybody flings. And so we try to normalize it. And we try to say, yeah, it's, it's, it's okay. It's cool. It's, it's hip. And it's a failure to recognize the incredible price tag that comes behind it. 
Not just the price tag of Jesus who died for that sin, which he does, and he, he will forgive you in true repentance. But there's also that damage that comes to marriages that are destroyed because of it. Sometimes there's no coming back from it, beloved. And families are ripped apart. Children don't have a mom or a dad because mom or dad had a fling. And God sees the destruction that comes from that, that flingful moment. And that the world crashes around you when the bill for that comes due. And beloved, it always does. It always does. You can't take poison into your life and not think that it's not going to hurt you. And that's what we're talking about. So when God says no to things, it's not because God is saying no to fun. God is saying no because he cares about you. And again, going back to that analogy of, of family, as parents, we tell our children no because we see the harmful thing that can come from it. Children don't always see that, and especially the younger they are. They don't get it, but you, just, you, you don't sit there and try to explain it all to them. You just keep them from trying to, you know, to, to doing that. You, as the parent, know what's best for them, even if they don't right now know what's best for them, themselves. Jesus grieves over this kind of spiritual darkness that, that keeps humanity locked in this cycle of darkness. And beloved, we're surrounded by it all the time. And this is nothing new. Don't, don't think that this, what we're seeing now is something new and, and wow, this is, this is dangerous, which it is, but it, it's, it's new. No, it's always been there, beloved. It's just that there's been a covering over it for a long time. And now the spiritual forces of darkness think that they've got the culture and the society where it can be, that we can strip that away now too and make it normal. But there's nothing new. Go back to Ecclesiastes from Solomon's writing. Vanity of vanities. There is nothing new under the sun. There isn't. There isn't anything that human beings can do to one another that hasn't been done before. And that too is a kind of blindness, isn't it? To not recognize what's going on. And this is how Satan keeps us and our culture locked in darkness. And that's why, beloved, more than political power, the power of the kingdom of God is far greater. That's why you're in this world, beloved, to take your place as a son and daughter of God and to reach those lives that are flailing about in the darkness and they don't even know that they're in the darkness. Not that we would be angry at them and condemning of them, but instead have compassion, have pity, and see what they're doing in their own lives and to themselves. And out of compassion, try to go that extra mile with them. Lovingly, respectfully, just like the Bible teaches. Be prepared to, to speak about your faith at, a given, at any given moment, but do it in gentleness and in kindness. Again, another great example is the political season. How much is being said in, in, in respect and kindness? I'm not hearing it. And I'll admit there are times where I don't feel it. And those are times that in my life and in your life, we need to seek out God's forgiveness and say, Lord, I'm losing my light. I'm letting the world's way of getting things done permeate me instead of your way of getting things done. And when the church gathers together, not in political power, but in the power of Jesus' name, and we pray, and we make ourselves available to touch the broken world around us without going, ew, or ew, you're awful. How can you live like this? And instead, touch the world as Jesus did, coming alongside and opening a door to something different than where their world is leading them. Think of someone like Matthew. Years and years spent at that, that tax collector's booth being written off by, by the culture that he had written off and thinking there was no hope for him, there was no return. And Jesus one day wanders into his life, seemingly coincidental, 
It wasn't. This was an appointment God had made from the very beginning of time and before that he would stand outside Matthew's tax collecting hut and say, come, follow me. And it was just at the right moment where Matthew's kingdom of dirt and dust and ashes that seemed so appealing but had long since crashed to the ground and he was desperately dying inside that Jesus held out a new life to him. And Matt's life was never the same again. Beloved, we have that power. You have that power to touch the lives of people around you with a life-giving, life-changing message of Jesus. You can introduce them to Jesus. You can share who Jesus is, what Jesus has done in your life, not in some sappy, syrupy way, but really in some of the real gritty areas of your life too and how you weren't maybe uh, telling a story that shows you to your best advantage. In fact, it shows you to a very a bad disadvantage, but it shows God to his advantage how he didn't give up on me, how God didn't turn his back on me, and how God still continued to care about me even when everybody else had given up, even me. This is the message that we have. Jesus grieves over the spiritual blindness that keeps us from helping to unlock the world that is still stumbling around in that darkness just as he grieves for the world that is stumbling in that darkness. These words from Luke 13, 34. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets, stones God's messengers. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hand protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. See, God's not going to force his way into your life. Jesus won't push his way into your life. He won't browbeat you into his life. He entreats you, yes, He's persistent, absolutely, but he won't force you. He wants you to willingly want what God has to offer. When you're tempted to give up, remember, Jesus died for these sins too. And that in each generation, his love for this world, it provides the tools that we need the very tools that we need in our stumbling that we've learned and grown from, those become the tools that we can use, that we need to guide those in darkness into the light of truth. And that leads us to our last point on the outline, and that is a failure to recognize Jesus still happens today, is happening, continues to happen. And it will continue to happen until Jesus comes comes at the end. And the Bible tells us that, that there will come that point when that, that last believer believes and then how many of you have been tracking March Madness? Come on. Wow, really? Huh. <laughs> how many of you have been tracking March, March Madness? There we go. Well, I, boy, I, I hit the wrong one there. I thought for sure there would be either that or it's a guilty pleasure and people aren't raising their hands or they're thinking, I'm going to get it. No, you're not. I'm just thinking, you know, at the, at the end of the game, the buzzer goes off, the horn goes off, and it's over with. The game is done. And at the end of all things, when that last believer comes to faith in Jesus Christ, that's when Jesus will come. But until that time, beloved, we are the people that he has planted in this world in place to reach all those people. It's, it's a gift and a burden that God has given to each one of us. And we still have our work cut out for us. Let's take a look at Romans 10, 14. That'll be the last place we look in God's word today. As I said, we still have our work cut out, cut out for us. There's lots for us to do. There are lots of hearts to reach, lots of people that need to know about Jesus. And they're not going to know about him unless we tell them about him. We can't leave it up to somebody else to do it because somebody else may not be there. It's one of my favorite lines, I like to say this in, you know, in churches, is we, ask, we talk about something and somebody says, well, somebody else will do it. 
And I love to come back with this response. I, you know, I was going through the church records, and I can't find anybody in here who's named somebody else. <laughs> Strike that from your vocabulary. Somebody else will. I'm, I'm serious, beloved. Strike that. Because in a way, that's a refusal to listen to God's leading. And instead, say something like this. God, if you want me, don't know why you would. I'm not very good at this kind of thing. How many of you, does that appeal? You don't have to stick your hand up in the air. But how many of you does that resonate with, I don't know why you would. I'm not very good at this. But God, if you want to, okay. I'll take that step of faith. And beloved, a lot of times that first step that you take, you're gritting your teeth, you are, and that moment comes and, and, and you, you, you do the thing that God puts on your heart to do, and a lot of times you look and I say, oh man, that was awful, I just, I just crashed and burned, and God's sitting there saying, no, you, you took the step of faith I needed you to do, you did exactly what I wanted you to do. Now we're going to build on that, and we're going to learn from that. And we're going to learn to smooth down some of those edges that maybe to you seemed so kind of abrupt and, and clunky. So that in time, you'll get so good at this, it'll just be second nature to you to be able to share about your love for me. And when you care about somebody deeply, when you love somebody, you don't have to think about how to tell others about that. It just flows naturally because it's right there in your heart. People may know that, that Jesus was a good man. They might. A lot of people will say that, yeah, G people who aren't believers say, yeah, Jesus was a, was a good man. He was, he was a good teacher. They may even believe that, and understand that we know that we believe that Jesus is actually the Son of God, but that doesn't mean that they do. It doesn't mean they do. That's where we come in to help them understand the single most important question any human being can ever ask and, be, and have answered. And it comes down to like what Jesus said. Who do people say I am? And then he follows it up now more personally. Not what the crowd is saying. Who do you say I am? Jesus asked this question after the disciples had been with him for quite some time. And it's Peter, led by the power of the Holy Spirit, they will say, you are the Son of God. And Jesus acknowledges that this is the power of the Holy Spirit. And he says, blessed are you, Peter. Because you didn't come up with this on your own. The Holy Spirit has revealed this to you. And this is what the church will be built upon. This confession of faith. That confession of faith that doesn't originate in here, but from here by the power of the Holy Spirit, revealing to us that Jesus Christ truly is the Son of the living God. That God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him should die. That Jesus himself went willingly and freely to the cross to pay for my sin and for the sins of the whole world. That is a faith that only God can give. And our role is to patiently walk alongside those who don't know him yet. Not to give up. Not to wash your hands of them. But to continue to walk with them as long as they'll let you. Now if they tell you to pound sand, then respect that. But if they don't, and they kind of keep coming back, or they're kind of open for you to keep coming back, that's a door that God is leaving open. In our instant gratification society, we even want our conversions to happen like that. The conversion that you may be part of, that God may be allowing you to be a part of, may take years. But think of what it's going to be like that day when that person finally says, I believe, I believe what you've been telling me. I know you believed it, but now I see it for myself. Think how happy you will be. And those years that you spent planting that seed, nurturing that seed, encouraging that seed, you won't think it was wasted time. You'll be on cloud nine too. And you will be so humbled that God allowed you to be part of this great victory. Romans 10, 14 points out to us as Christ followers the dilemma that we find ourselves in if we keep this great message to ourselves... Paul writes, how can they call on him, Jesus, to save them unless they believe in him? That's a good question. And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? That's where we come in. 
That's our role. We're that bridge between God and them. Now, you might say, I'm a pretty clunky, (laughs) uh, uh, unstable kind of bridge. God says, I don't care. You're a bridge. And I can use you to touch their lives. In fact, maybe that person, (laughs) it's weird, but it's true. Maybe that person needs the clunky bridge that you are. Maybe a really great, wonderful, awesome bridge that would just, that, that wouldn't appeal to them. Maybe they like that, uh, that pre-Columbian bridge in the jungle that's held, held together by jungle vines and who knows what else, that, rotting wood and, and, and looks like it's going to fall apart any instant. Maybe that's exactly what they're looking for. Maybe that's exactly what God wants to use you to be. Beloved, it's a privilege for us to help people recognize who Jesus is and to help them to see his love for them. And and then if they reject that, that's not on you. You're not responsible for whether someone believes or not. Our responsibility is simply to let people know about the love of Jesus Christ. But never let it be said of you that you were the cause of somebody failing to recognize Jesus through your words and actions. Instead, let it always be said of you that Christ's light shines in you. Now God's people said, Amen. Amen.